gracious God in heaven, you are indeed mighty to save. And you can, oh God, move the mountains. In fact, many years ago, on this day that we're remembering, you moved a mountain, a mountain of sin. You moved the weight of humanity's sinfulness, our sinfulness. You took it with you to the cross, nailing it along with you there. And it remains there yet today. We can come here and worship today knowing that if we belong to you in faith, then our sins have been as far removed from us as the east is from the west. They've been hurled into the depths of the sea, and you remember them no more. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you for this day, for what this day represents, for who this day represents, and all that your Son, Jesus, came to do on our behalf. We acknowledge him this morning, Lord. We acknowledge him this morning, Savior. And we acknowledge him this morning, O oh God, the coming one. For he is going to return to claim that which is his own. We await that day. And until that day comes, May we be found faithful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. We are so glad to be together as two congregations this morning. Um, the Peterborough Free Methodist Church from across the road and Living Hope here. And no doubt there are other guests with us as well this morning. Welcome to you. Isn't it good to be together as the body of Christ? Amen. It's this cross that unites us, right? It's this cross that has drawn us together to be one body under Him. And so we come to give Him thanks today. Take a moment to uh, find someone you haven't had the opportunity to greet yet this morning and uh, give them a blessing as you extend the hand of fellowship.
On this Good Friday, it is a joy to be together with the Congregation of Living Hope. Thank you so much again for your invitation to join you uh, across the street. Uh, we uh, give thanks to the Lord for the wonderful way that uh, our congregations together can see what God is doing in our community, and we give thanks to him for that. On this Good Friday, the only place uh, to preach from, preach about, is the cross. Although I'm not going to preach from one of the traditional passages that are associated with Good Friday, I'm preaching this morning from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But I want to set the context by reading Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us pray. Lord, may the reality of what happened that day, designed by you, the Father and the Spirit, from the beginning of time, from before the beginning of time, be real in this place this day. We ask in your name. Amen. The word glory is usually associated with something positive. We speak of a glorious sunset or a glorious spiritual experience or the glory of God. The word glory is rarely, if ever, associated with something negative. How then can the Apostle Paul, when writing to the Galatian Christians in 49 AD, say to them in chapter 6, verse 14 of the letter to Galatia, But far be it from me to glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. What glory could there be in a cross? In a cross on which a 30-year-old carpenter from Nazareth was crucified some 20 years before Paul writes those words. Isn't a cross an object of shame, a place of execution for someone guilty of a capital offense? Didn't the Old Testament itself in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, give explicit instructions to bury the body of one hung on a tree before nightfall because, and I quote, anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. How then could St. Paul say that he had no basis for glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? The answer to that question is found in many places in the Pauline writings of the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 forms the basis of the answer to that question that I want to leave with you on this Good Friday morning. Why should we glory in the cross? God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, why glory in the cross? 
Why should it be the basis of our faith? Because it reveals, first, the love of God. Second, the sinfulness of humankind. Third, the sacrificial death of Christ. First, it reveals the love of God. In the 18th century, at the time of John Wesley, a concept called deism dominated the intellectual community. They believed in a personality-less God, a God who wound up the alarm clock of the universe and was just watching it as it wound down. A God who was not personally involved in our lives. In our life and times, the New Age movement, which is just Hinduism in the Western world's language, says that all is God and God is all. It's a, a new kind of pantheism, which believes that humankind, animals, and even inanimate objects are part of the nature, even go so far as to say the essence of God. Contrast deism and the New Age movement with the description of God found in Holy Scripture. St. Paul says it like this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. There's some key ideas in this phrase of scripture, which we as believers assume but need to be reminded of on this Good Friday. Christian theologians struggle to describe the nature of God in a single concept. Some use the concept of holiness, others mercy, some justice, some omniscience, omnipotence. Paul uses one word. The word is love. It's a, a word that's used by many of the other New Testament writers as well. For example, John in his first epistle, chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. But this is not some kind of sentimental Hollywood love, which is big on words and short on action. No, absolutely not. St. Paul says that God demonstrates his love. How does he do that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves, but it's not just words. It's a demonstration. He demonstrates his love. But it goes even a step beyond that because Paul says God demonstrates his own love. It belongs to him. It's his nature. It's not copied or borrowed. It's an intrinsic part of his nature. It belongs to him. The prayer for spiritual communion in the Lord's Supper in the Methodist ritual reads, But you, O Lord, are unchanging in your mercy, and your nature is love. So if you're looking for a description of what God is like. If you're trying to describe him to someone even over these Easter weekend days, tell them that God is love. Why glory in the cross? Because on that cross, God demonstrates his own love for us. Second now, why glory in the cross? Because of the sin of humankind. The culture in which we live doesn't like the word sin. We developed uh, some other words. An error. A mistake in judgment. Sometimes we'll say the person is simply immature. Or more often, we dismiss the concept altogether. Even within the family of God, the community of Christ, the word sin has fallen on hard times. It's not often we hear it. 
That's the effect, the encroaching effect of the culture upon us. But the whole idea of Scripture is that we are, as human beings, by nature sinful. Sin is still sin. The story of salvation that culminates on this Good Friday morning is unnecessary if there is no sin in the world. You don't need a Savior if there's no sin. But sin is still sin. And if you want current evidence of that, read the Peterborough Examiner with its daily reality of what is going on in both our community and our world. We as Christians should not be afraid of the word sin. It's the right word. But the amazing thing that Paul says in this phrase of Holy Scripture is that the demonstration of God's own love towards us was while we were still sinners. Many people think that they have to be all cleaned up before they present themselves to God for cleansing from sin and sinfulness. The apostle says that the demonstration of God's love for us while we were still sinners demonstrates the reality that there's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up. No amount of cleaning up cleanses us. The gospel does not subscribe to a bootstraps theology. It says the problem of sin can only be dealt with if there is help from outside coming in, not from inside going out. It had to be an invasion as opposed to a, a self-realization or self-actualization. And all human beings are under this sin curse. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even the psalmist David, a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross, understood that we as human beings were under this sin curse. He says, the Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have become together corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, which we believe is the basis for Romans 3:23, where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So why glory in the cross? Because while we were still sinners, because the revelation of God's love for us was before we got cleaned up, he's the one that does the cleansing. <laughs> Thirdly, why glory in the cross? Because of the sacrificial death of Christ. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross has two immediate impacts. First, it is the final evidence as to the nature of God. If there's any doubt as to God's nature, it is completely swept away by what takes place on the cross. The cross is God's final love letter to humankind. All that we can know about God has been told to us by his son through his life, his death, his resurrection. Again, John writes in John chapter 1, verse 18, No one has ever seen God, but God, the only son who is at the Father's side, has made him known. The second thing that happens is that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross sacrificially rescues us from the curse of our sin and sin's logical consequence eternal death. C.S. Lewis says these words in Mere Christianity about the, the idea of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, which is really what we're talking about, that he took our place there. C.S. Lewis writes, the perfect submission, the perfect suffering, the perfect death were not only easier to Jesus because he was God, but were possible only because he was God. Why glory in the cross? Because of the love of God. 
God demonstrates his own love. Why glory in the cross? Because of the sinfulness of humankind while we were still sinners. Why glory in the cross? Because of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. The Watertown New York Daily Times carried a story on July the 29th, 2001, which was entitled, Inventor Floats Life-Saving Idea, But Nobody's Climbing Aboard. That story was about my late uncle, Oliver J. Wisner, my mother's brother. Uncle Oliver, a graduate of the Syracuse University Law School in 1966. By the way, Syracuse uh, won that basketball game last night, if you were a match, Mark, March Madness fans. Uncle Oliver practiced law in Watertown, New York for more than 40 years. But although he was known at the height of his uh, legal uh, profession, at the height of his legal career, as the finest estate law lawyer in in Lewis and Jefferson counties. His claim to fame in that community, notably, was that he was a self-styled inventor. The story written in the Watertown Daily Times was about this life-saving device for which Uncle Oliver received a patent. And if you do not believe me, I have a copy of the patent with me this morning. Now, this patent was from the U.S. Commissioner of Patents and Trademarks on April the 20th, 1999. Now, to quote the reporter, a date that shall live in obscurity, it now appears. So, what is this life-saving device? My Uncle Oliver, again quoting from Watertown Daily Times, has hitched his star and his watered treading untanned body to a pair of empty two-quart plastic bottles. He hangs them by their handles from a belt worn around his waist while swimming. If his device for staying afloat seems like nothing more than one man's application of common sense and common materials, well, Oliver has a patent on it. There's only one problem. Uncle Oliver has a patent, but nobody wants to produce his product. Because all it is, and I've got the schematics of it to show you, even the patent office required a schematic, it's two Javex bottles <laughs> around one's waist, tied onto one's waist by a belt. So Uncle Oliver couldn't get anyone to buy this patent. And so he decided to get the Watertown Daily Times involved. And he took this reporter to the shores of the Black River in Watertown, New York. Some of you will probably know where that is because of the connection, long, long connection of Fisher Gage to Watertown. Now, there's one more piece of information that you need to know before you hear what really happened when Uncle Oliver went into the Black River with these two Javex bottles around his waist. Uncle Oliver was a hopeless diabetic. At any family reunion that we would have, he brought the chocolate bars. And in 1998, three years before this article, he had his right leg amputated above the knee. It only kept him out of the office for two weeks, I must add. So Uncle Oliver takes off this prosthetic foot and lower leg, sets the limb beside a folding chair at the edge of the water, and then the reporter says, he wore a pair of lime green shorts with a black leather belt, two detergent bottles hung by their handles from the belt, and into the Black River he went. Now those lime green shorts he wore at every family event for 40 years, so I know exactly what they look like. Now the amazing thing about this whole story, and what the reporter was baffled by, was it worked. Oliver floated in shallow water, smiling in his element. The white bottle swayed and bobbed on his lower back like an oddly familiar pair of angel's wings. 
Now, here's the story. My Uncle Oliver passed away September the 30th, 2009, without anyone ever picking up his patent. He gave copies of it to anyone that was alive in his family connection that would take a copy of it, hoping that someday it would be actually fulfilled. But he never lived to see it, and the patent expires. In uh, It's a 14-year patent, which I didn't know uh, was part of the whole process, but it expires on the 20th of April next month, 2013. But... I have late breaking news for you this morning. <laughs> you, the congregation of Living Hope, on this Good Friday. Ingrid, would you mind putting that slide up? You will see that Michael de Block found this for me. Don't ask me what he was looking for on the internet when he found this. <laughs> but you will see that a little boy in Bucharest, Romania, learned all about Uncle Oliver's invention. And he has got four pop bottles on a belt, and he's jumping into this body of, of water. And there's my Uncle Oliver. Ingrid beautifully put his picture on the slide for us. He's looking down with great joy that someone finally has picked up on his idea. And it works. I wonder if God ever feels like my Uncle Oliver. He's got this great life-saving idea, and it works. But people will come right up to a moment like this this morning, where the opportunity to receive this life-giving sacrifice is freely given. And they say no. I wonder if God ever feels rejected. Someone here this morning has been offered this gift many times. Maybe this morning there's someone here being offered this gift of salvation for the very first time. This gift of forgiveness. Forgiveness for this life and eternal life in the world which is to come. Time and a time and again, you've said, no, it's not for me. You know, I, I have to confess that there's times I'm baffled by people's rejection of God. And I think the reason I'm baffled by it is the life that they have is terrible. It's rotten. And yet they won't take a chance that maybe this gift of salvation that God offers freely, you can't, you can't earn it. You just have to receive it. It's a gift. I wonder why. I've come to this conclusion. Most people say no to Jesus Christ because they don't want to give up their life. Even if it may be not what it could be or should be, or what they even want it to be. They do not want to take their hands off. They do not want to give the control of their lives to someone else. And that, that is required. I mean, I, it would be wrong for me to tell you differently this morning. You have to give your life away. But Jesus put it like this. Anyone who gives their life away We'll find it. So this morning, as we come to the table of the Lord, this is one more time for those of us who claim the name of Jesus, the glory in the cross. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is our opportunity to receive that gift again by faith. For someone else this morning, for the very first time, you're going to take your hands off your life and say, I give everything I know of myself in this moment to you, Lord Jesus.
clean me up, set me free to be who I am and who you desire me to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. to the Lord, I'm going to invite uh, the deacons to, to come forward and to receive those offerings. This morning our gifts are going toward uh, the Brock Mission, of course part of their responsibility is Cameron House as well, and so as we bring our gifts this morning, we're mindful of those 
uh, in our own community in need this day. We extend that love of Christ, the love that he's shown to us. We extend it to others as we bring our gifts. <laughs>